Right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if I could ask you all to take a seat, I think the uh, organiser of the conference is keen that we should get going. Uh, no doubt we've overrun lunch, I suspect. Would that be right? Um, we have an excellent panel this afternoon, and I will introduce them in a moment. Can I just take a few moments to put this afternoon's session in context? Uh, talking to, to other panellists, I think uh, we did have the view that perhaps this panel should have come first, that we've really done things the wrong way round. Starting with litigation is, uh, is a little odd. Well, normally it ends up in litigation rather than starting with it. And of course, I think the key point here is that when dealing with shared resources and, uh, and international water courses are a uh, prime example of such resources, then uh, the normal way for managing those resources is cooperatively all of the states concerned get together, uh, they, cooperate, they cooperate in management. Uh, we heard in the previous panel how important that is, and there's no doubt that when you look at the law of international water courses, uh, you're principally looking at water course treaties for particular water courses, um, and we will hear more about that today. And I think that's really my introduction uh, to what this afternoon is about. Uh, we've got three speakers who will talk about um, a specific aspects of particular water regimes and more broadly. The only point that I would also add, um, and I think this comes back to the significance of, of Gabchikovo, the um, speakers this morning managed to, uh, uh, well, I did not get around to answering the question that I deliberately posed, but since it wasn't answered, let me answer it. I think one of the key points of Gabchikovo uh, is that it reminded everybody and has continued to remind us all that watercourse treaties do not live in a vacuum. They have to be interpreted and applied by reference to and taking account of general international law. And that, I think, is one of the key points of the 1977 treaty in, in Gabchikovo, and the court was absolutely right to read that treaty and then evolutionary way, which took into account developments in principles adopted at Rio and indeed in rules of international environmental law. That was taken even further in the Pulpmose case. Again, that was a treaty dispute, but the treaty was interpreted and uh, applied, also taking into account developments in general international environmental law. And we've seen that more recently on one of the panelists here today knows all about this. Uh, we've seen that more recently in a different context in the South China Sea case, where the law of the Sea Convention was read in an evolutionary way on the environmental issues, taking into account more recent developments in international environmental law. And I think there's a, this, is, this is one of the areas where there is cross-fertilization between the law of the sea and international water course law. That need to look at treaties and international law generally coherently I think that's the more important word today than fragmentation. For 20 years, we've talked about fragmentation. Well, I, I would stress in this context coherence, not fragmentation. So I think that's why it will be interesting to listen to our three speakers. Um, uh, Professor Fishbender uh, will, uh, will talk about um, the transboundary water treaty is accommodating uncertainty. Uh, he has undoubted expertise in that area um, at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and he's written on conflict resolution, natural resources, not just water. Um, he, I think, rightly takes a much broader view of these issues than simply focusing on water. Um, and he's undoubtedly one of the leading uh, scholars on transboundary water issues and institutions in the Middle East in particular. Our second speaker will be well known to many in this audience, Judith Levine, who's senior legal counsel at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague. One of the interesting features of, of, of litigating in international courts is you spend an awful lot of time peering at the judges and the registrars and, uh, and wondering what they're thinking. And they actually probably spend quite a lot of time you know, peering at counsel and wondering what on earth they're thinking. Um, and uh, you do occasionally try to work out. And I, I spent three weeks looking an awful lot of the time at Judith since she was opposite me. Um, she didn't give anything away. She did smile occasionally, which was nice, but I certainly hadn't the foggiest idea what she was thinking about anything. Whereas Judge Wolfram, he's easy. You can absolutely read his face to a T. I don't recommend it if you're a judge. Um, 
Uh, but she is going to talk not about Law of the Sea today, but about the Permanent Court of Arbitration's role in, in or potential role in international water disputes. Uh, and, and no doubt in that context, it is as much of a role as it has in the Law of the Sea and a variety of other uh, situations. She has been registrar in the South China Sea arbitration, uh, the Atlanto Scandi and Herring arbitration. Uh, the Abay arbitration and a variety of other cases. Uh, so she's a very experienced practitioner um, and um, she runs a very, very good ship is all I can say. I can highly recommend the Permanent Court of Arbitration. And then our final speaker today um, is an old friend and colleague of mine, Professor Laurence Basson de Chazeur from the University of Geneva. She is, of course, well known for her writing on, on international water course law. Uh, but like me, she has another string to her bow that she occasionally pops up in the ICJ. Um, I can't quite remember when I first met her, but she first came to my attention when she was opposite me in the Pulp Mills case, and I had to do my best to demolish her arguments. Um, you can work out whether I was successful or not, but they were good arguments. And um, uh, it's, it, it's a sign of something that we're now on the same side in the uh, Salala Waters case. Uh, so we've got three excellent panelists today. I will shut up and uh, they will perform. Uh, and I hope we'll have a good session. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, good afternoon. To be honest, I'm very stressed about my talk. That, uh, that, that relates to two issues. The first one is that I am not a lawyer. I'm a political geographer. I do governance of natural resources, water, and energy diplomacy. And the second reason has to do with the fact that it's the second time in my life that I have a, a tie and a suit. But one of the speakers told me that there is no other option. So as you could see, the presentation is about how to accommodate uncertainty in water treaty design. And you're probably wondering, why do we need that? And that has to do, that has to do with the fact that uncertainties are there and they're not going anywhere and are going to increase in the future given climate change and political instability. And on top of it, in most cases, we have to live with the current agreements. Under the current water scarcity, we are not likely to get a better agreements. So we need to maintain them, although some of them were signed even a century ago, like the US-Canadian agreement. And we need to make sure they could accommodate some uncertainties. So that's why it's a big challenge. And given that challenge for the last 10 years, I've been struggling with a few big questions. The first question has to do with how can we accommodate uncertainty? What mechanisms and strategies we could build into agreements that when stuff happens, different type of uncertainties, we could accommodate it that the treaties will function? That's the first question. The second question has to do with the effect of uncertainty on cooperation. And the literature is quite often divided on that impact. Some would say, some international relations scholars would say that uncertainty will bring us together, would foster collective action, think of water scarcity and an attempt of a few countries to build a joint, maybe desalination plant. But others, scholars would say that it does exactly the opposite. It pulls us apart. It creates tension and friction. And that's an open question in the literature. That's the second question I've been struggling with. I'm not sure, I'm not sure given the time constraint that I will have time to address it. And the third one relates to treaty implementation. OK, so we adopted a bunch of mechanisms. Honestly, we don't know which one of them performs better. We don't know which one of them are, is being adopted and which one is being not used, although we may find it in the treaty language. So that's another open question that the literature does not answer. What's the methodology? I'm an empiricist in the sense that I build quite, 
have a tendency once in a while to build a data set. And here together with a, few, with a colleague of mine, Mark Giordano from Georgetown University, and a previous student of us, Elena Drishanova, we decided to build a water treaty data set. We used the previous one, which was built by a friend of mine, Aaron Wolf. We updated it, and all together we ended up with about 300 water agreements that were signed in the last half a century. We did not include treaties that relates to navigation. We included only treaties that treats water as a consumable resource. And then we started to analyze the data set. So everything that I'm about to show you based on, is based on our analysis. So the first challenge was to conceptualize the uncertainties. What negotiators should be afraid of during the negotiation and during the implementation? And we made a few distinctions. The first one is what we call exogenous resource uncertainties. So uncertainties that relates to the material nature of the resource. Will there be a drought? How deep the drought will be? How deep it would be? We really don't know. Definitely not in 100%. The second, or another option is uncertainty that relates to the resource. In case there is scarcity, we don't know how an ecosystem will survive a particular drought. No one could tell us that with certainty. Another type of uncertainty is exogenous background uncertainties. We are quite often not sure about the context, the future political relations between states. We are uncertain about whether the treaty will be ratified. We are uncertain about issues in the global economy. For example, what would be the price of grain in the global market? Because if the price goes down, then you could engage with virtual water. You could trade with grain, which means that you have more water to give your neighbor. So we are not sure about that. And because of that, also to deal with uncertainty, we sign treaties. The problem is that while we sign water agreements, we create a new type of uncertainties. We don't know if parties will comply with the agreement. And then we realize that we could come up with four strategies for dealing with the uncertainties, and I will elaborate on each one of them in a few minutes. So that was the first step, conceptualize the big uncertainties. And then we started to build a typology of different mechanisms, not strategies, but mechanisms for accommodating the uncertainty. The most basic one relates to how do we divide the resource, the location mechanism. And here you could see that we made a distinction between direct allocation, like fixed allocation, a country may decide to deliver its neighbor a particular amount of water regardless any circumstances. Or we could divide it according to flow percentage. It may decide to give 10% of the flow to its neighbor. So if there is surplus, if it's a wet year, they all enjoy the surplus. If it's a dry year, they all share the deficiencies. Indirect allocation relates to communication channels or principles of allocation. And we mentioned before, equitable and reasonable, no significant harm, and other principles. Or we could go for a prioritization option. What does it mean, prioritization? Country A, a must deliver a certain amount of fresh water, portable water to its neighbor. But whenever it comes to water for the environment, which is secondary, then it may decide to deliver less than that. So we prioritize what is more important and less. Then I will realize that actually we could build a spectrum, a spectrum between mechanisms that some of them correspond with being more adjustable, while others are more fixed. For example, if we take a deficit mechanism, if you read the US-Mexico 1944 agreement, it states that on the Rio Grande, Mexico has to deliver the US a certain amount of water, but it can accumulate a deficit, and after a few years, it has to pay back the water. So it gives some flexibility, but again, it seems to be more fixed than the option of percentage of flow. 
So we would have a, a continuum between mechanisms that are fixed and those that are adjustable. But still we were wondering about why. Why do we go for one type rather than the other? And again, the literature is very silent about that. And then we approached the data set and we were trying to find out what policymakers do in real life. And we could see that in real life, the mechanism of low percentage, and quite often in the literature, it is being described as an ideal type of mechanism, right? But in real life, only in a minority of agreements, 6% of them, we will find division based on percentage of flow, which is a bit of a surprise for us. In most cases, we will find indirect allocation. Communication channels, which I will speak about them in a second. But the big challenge was the why. What characterize, what is the nature of the mechanisms and the nature of the negotiator? So I did a different attempt and I decided to pick two variables. One variable is the attitude of the negotiator towards risk, whether he is a risk seeker or risk avoider. The other option is whether he likes high gain or whether he is conservative and he is willing to go for a very low gain. And now you could, you could actually project the different mechanisms that I mentioned. And for example, we could see that quadrat number one means that you go for a high risk and you also expect to have a high gain. So that's a, a sort of a gambling approach. And the mechanism of percentage of flow would correspond with this option. As opposed to it, we have the solid investor approach. He doesn't like risk, but he knows that he cannot expect much. For example, the mechanism of fixed based on minimal flows. You must deliver me a fixed amount of water, but don't expect much because you will get it and uh, under any circumstances. In between, we have another option of going for a high risk. Sorry, going, not taking the risk, but going for a very high gain, which means that it's a sort of a, a gambler's paradise. You don't want to take your chances, but you are willing or you expect to get everything. And the other option is what I can call fool's paradise. You don't like risk. Sorry, you do like, you do like risk, but you don't expect to have a high gain. And as we could see, none of the mechanisms correspond with fool's paradise. So that was a very early attempt to try to figure out how negotiators behave. But then we realized that there are other mechanisms to deal with uncertainty. For example, the most obvious way, which is the most politically feasible way, is let's, in let's enhance the supply, right? Let's build new infrastructure, like a joint desalination dam. Let's foster technology transfer. We could guide our neighbors on how to drill deeper and better. Let's go for joint action and even a, a bizarre clause of mutual assistance, which exists in the Israeli-Jordanian agreement, which was signed about 23 years ago. And again, let's go, to this, let's go to real life. And we could see that in most cases, except of technology transfer, those mechanisms are not so common. Another option is let's broaden the cooperation. Rather than just discussing surface water, we could actually discuss water quality if there is a crisis, if there is uncertainty. We can even spill into discussing groundwater, hydropower generation, and let's even discuss water together with non-water issues. Trade, security, just name it. And the idea is that the more issues are on the table, it provides more leeway to the negotiators. It allows us to be engaged with some horse trading, some quid per quo, as we usually do in, in our personal life, at least me. If we go to the statistics, we could see that indeed, when there are uncertainties, many agreements would have a mandate to deal with issues of water quality. But in, 
just a few of them, we could find language that allows the negotiator to link water with non-water issues. It does not mean that it does not exist, but at least we would not likely to find it in the treaty language. And of course, there is the option of, as we discussed earlier, formalized communication channels, joint institutions that would build trust, would reduce the transaction costs of negotiation, consultation as a conflict resolution mechanism, data exchange, and even the option of arbitration, which we know that it's an exception. Usually they talk, they don't go to court. And again, you could see the distribution and you could see that joint institutions, it's a very common way to accommodate uncertainty and definitely consultation is the most common way to accommodate, to try to accommodate uncertainty. I'm skipping, I'm skipping because I have a feeling that I'm running out of time. Right? Some early lessons. So we've seen that there is more than one way to accommodate uncertainty. And we've seen that some mechanisms allow changing the rules of the game, while others enhance the capacity to absorb shocks. Some are based on high flexibility, while others are based on high enforceability. And we've seen that most mechanisms seem to correspond with what we call an open-end approach. And I will get to that in a second. But then we realized that we did a mistake in our analysis, because in a way we clustered, we lumped all of the agreements together. And actually we expect historical agreements, even, th even those that were negotiated 30 years ago, to be different than the language of contemporary agreements, right? So we decided to do it differently and to divide the treaties into groups. But now let, let me go back to the strategies. If you remember at the beginning, I made a distinction between mechanisms and big strategies. And then we realized that there are big strategies for accommodating uncertainty. For example, we could go for a complete contract approach. We could have a very detailed agreement, a bulletproof agreement against uncertainty that any possible scenario will be covered by different legal clauses, right? Which means that the structure would be hard codification of rules, which means that it would take a long time to negotiate the agreement, but it may mean that the readiness to act during the implementation may be higher. Maybe, we don't know. As the, op the other approach is exactly the opposite. That's an open-end approach which means that we accept the fact that, the, that there is uncertainty. It is given, it is stochistic. We cannot avoid it. The only thing we could do is build processes. And for example, many adjustable mechanisms and cons consultation mechanisms, and we expect that it would be easier to reach an agreement, but we also expect that when we need to implement the agreement, then it may be tricky, especially if the language is ambiguous. And in many cases, we know that that's the language of water agreements. Another option is, of course, let's ignore the uncertainty. Let's focus on certainty, on the facts that we know that are likely to happen. And finally, there is the option of reducing the uncertainty. Let's make sure that within the agreement, we have scenario building and modeling and we are able to reduce the uncertainty while we implement the agreement. Three minutes. The next step was to go back to the mechanisms, not the strategies, and to correspond a mechanism with a strategy. You don't have to read it, I will give you an example. A mechanism of variable allocation, percentage of flow, would correspond with a complete contract. A vague allocation mechanism would correspond with an open end. And what it actually allows us is to identify how mechanisms change a long time. And we could see here the timeline, historical agreements that were signed a century ago, contemporary ones, and here we measure the average number of mechanisms that correspond with the different strategies. For example, in the past, a century ago, treaties would have 2.5 
mechanisms on average that correspond with an open-end approach. Nowadays, agreements that were signed lately would have 3.5 mechanisms that correspond with an open-end approach, which means that current agreements are mostly processes, procedures, they are open for interpretation, they are highly ambiguous, which means that negotiating them, negotiating the agreements, it's only the first step. The biggest obstacle is implementing them. We could also see that the complete contract and the reducing, they go up and down, but mo they're mostly steady, which means that we do not have a trade-off between the different strategies, which means that treaties are more complicated. They would include more mechanisms that would correspond with the three different strategies. So it's a sort of a portfolio approach. If one mechanism fails, then it would have a backup. I'm finishing. Okay, final, final points. We've seen that there is an ideal approach to treaty design and there is real life. And in most cases, the mechanisms that are adopted have to be politically feasible. They could not have high sovereignty and political cost, which means that negotiators have to balance the benefit of a mechanism versus its cost. And as I mentioned, treaties, because of the open-end nature, will have to be further negotiated. We are still uncertain about what works better because there are no studies that trace the effectiveness of different type of mechanisms. And about the question of, of the role of uncertainty of co on cooperation, we are still inconclusive. We don't know if it brings us together or pull us apart. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to Hélène and her colleagues for inviting me to speak to you this afternoon about the role of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in respect of transboundary water disputes. I will briefly take you back a hundred years before reviewing some practical examples from the PCA's role in recent transboundary water disputes and then consider how that role is evolving in the face of new demands from the international dispute resolution community. Uh, as many of you will be familiar, the Permanent Court of Arbitration was brought about at the 1899 Hague Conference, the output of which was a treaty, the Hague Convention, that recognised arbitration as an effective and equitable means of settling legal disputes where diplomacy has failed. So when Ite mentioned that arbitration is rare and a last resort, that comes about when talks fail. That is the starting point for my presentation. It defined arbitration as the settlement of differences by judges of the party's own choice on the basis of respect for law, and it established the permanent court of arbitration to be accessible at all times for immediate recourse. As this panel is about institutions, a brief snapshot of what the PCA is as an institutional structure. It is an intergovernmental organisation with uh, 121 members. Um, the second organ, in addition to its member states, are the members of the court. Uh, some are pictured there, you may recognise them. Uh, they've each served roles as arbitrator, counsel or official commentator in some of our cases. And each member state can nominate up to four people to be on the list of the members of the court, but the parties are not bound to choose from that list. And thirdly, there's the International Bureau in The Hague, which is the secretariat um, where, uh, housed in the Peace Palace, which was uh, built to accommodate the PCA. Um, the role of the PCA and the International Bureau in freshwater disputes is what I will be focusing on today. Um, this slide, though, first shows what has happened in the course of the PCA's activity since the convention came out. 
There was some initial activity in the early 20th century, including some historic cases about law of the sea, um, the North Atlantic Fisheries case, Island of Palmas, and even a case on natural watercourses involving the island of Timor in the Dutch-Portuguese boundaries arbitration, uh, which touched on um, the location of two elusive rivers that weren't quite accurately reflected in the boundary treaty. And we'll return to the island of Timor at the end of my presentation. But you can see from this chart, notably, that there has been a sharp increase in activities in the last 15 to 20 years um, that started around the time that investor state arbitration uh, was beginning to take off and also after the UNCLOS had entered into force. How does the caseload look today? We are administering 130 cases uh, of on it changes week to week. Um, a portion of these are interstate disputes which have been brought where diplomacy has failed, pursuant to treaties or special agreements. A large number are mixed arbitrations between private parties on the one hand and states or intergovernmental organisations on the other. And several of those mixed arbitrations also involve water management issues, hydroelectric dams, uh, even alleged pollution and failure by a state to protect uh, watercourses in an, in an investor's uh, na nature sanctuary in Barbados. So over the course of recent years, um, the PCA has administered several interstate cases involving water. Uh, this slide is just a snapshot. It's rather brackish in the sense that it has salt water cases and freshwater cases. Um, there have been 13 arbitrations under Annex 7 and a number under bilateral and multilateral freshwater treaties. But how and why have those cases come to the PCA to be administered? It's not to do with the blue skies in The Hague depicted there. I didn't think it was to do with the quality of the coffee. Maybe that is the secret. Um, and it's not because the treaties themselves specify PCA. Annex 7 leaves, this, leaves the topic of case administration to the agreement of the parties or the discretion of the tribunal. Likewise, in two of the freshwater cases, I'll discuss the Rhine chlorides and Kishinganga. The respective treaties provide for the tribunal to have power over procedure, or in Kishinganga to establish a secretariat. And a number of the water conventions mentioned today also simply refer to arbitration without specifying an institution. So what is it that have brought the parties to the PCA and what kind of role do we perform in freshwater disputes? I'll cover <coughs> logistics, appointments, Experts, I'll return to some questions about site visits. Um, but starting with the basics, for an arbitration to happen, you need some organisational support, whether that's serving as a channel of communications, even in cases where the respondent is not participating, maintaining an archive, managing the costs of the case. Um, the, the idea is that it ultimately saves parties money to have an institution do this type of work than the tribunal and arbitrators doing it completely ad hoc. For states who can't afford the coffee, there might be uh, access to the PCA's financial assistance fund available to developing states in PCA cases. And uh, the PCA can provide privileges and immunities under our host country agreement, uh, various host country agreements and our headquarters agreement. Um, I'm going to refer to a case which I think wins the prize for having the least glamorous title of any case in international law, the Rhine Chlorides Arbitration Concerning the Auditing of Accounts. It, was, uh, it arose under a multilateral treaty and it concerned a dispute about France's contribution for chloride level reduction. Despite its rather dull title, the commentary to the published award prepared by Laurence uh, points out its significance in its contribution on treaty interpretation, the in economic aspects of environmental protection in the management of watercourses, and cost allocation as key to regimes set up to combat pollution. I just, this was uh, in 2004, and the PCA helped organize, uh, well, served as the registry, organized hearings in Paris as well as The Hague. Some people are surprised to learn that not all PCA hearings are held in The Hague. In fact, in interstate cases, the Mauritius UK had hearings in Istanbul and Dubai, 
uh, Arctic Sunrise was in Vienna. We've had hearings in uh, Singapore and London in interstate cases, and even in Windhoek, Namibia, not to be confused with Nambia. <laughs> Another role that the PCA can play as an institution is with respect to appointments. Um, the PCA Secretary General has served in that capacity in over 150 cases. Um, and he will do that when the parties have agreed to do so, which might be under the PCA rules or uh, the PCA's environmental rules, or it could be in a special agreement. An example that I will say involved a river for purposes of this dispute, of this panel, uh, was the ABA arbitration between the government of Sudan and the Sudanese People's Liberation Movement slash army. It certainly involved interesting questions in consideration of sources about the Bar El Arab river system. In that case, the PCA Secretary General was called on to appoint the chairman when the four party appointed arbitrators could not agree. But as we heard from Judge Tomka, other institutions are also involved in appointment of arbitrators. Under Annex 7, that role is given to the president of ITLAS. The Rhine Chlorides case provided for a role for the ECJ. And under the Indus Waters Treaty, the three umpires each have their own appointing authority depending on their um, area of expertise. And as Judge Tompkin mentioned, one of the seven members in that case was in fact an engineer, um, Howard Weeter, who was one of the seven members in a court of arbitration formed under a treaty where the parties had anticipated that technical issues would be very important. The more typical approach to technical evidence, however, as we've heard, is that the tribunal might appoint independent experts to assist them both in sifting through the competing party expert evidence and also uh, assist them in understanding technical issues. Um, the PCA is quite involved in that process once the tribunal identifies a need. Um, we will consult uh, with the parties on the need for an expert in the first place and what role that expert will play will invite their comments on the profile and qualifications, propose the candidates, send the CVs, and seek their declarations of independence, and also invite comments on the proposed terms of reference, uh, so that the role of that expert is very clearly understood by the parties. An example where that input was taken into account was in the terms of reference for the expert hydrographer in the Philippines-China arbitration, where one party expressed concern that the expert not overstep into the legal question of defining what is an island. We do not use expert fantôme or fantôme walking encyclopedias. Um, it's become our practice to make the whole process very transparent. An example that was also mentioned by Judge Tomka of an independent expert being appointed using this method was the Guyana versus Suriname arbitration. It was a maritime delimitation case, but it did involve um, identifying a marker on the Corentine River. And the PCA uh, organized uh, the hearings, which were in Washington, London, and The Hague, and also assisted in identifying experts on questions of Dutch law for colonial records and the hydrographer. And uh, my colleague accompanied the expert in a very small plane with the parties uh, to the mouth of the Quarantine River. Um, you'll see that this, this is actually the airport. Um, there were feral donkeys on the landing strip. It was a trip for the brave. Marker B was identified and uh, the coordinates written down, prepared in a report for the parties and actually that report was appended to the award. Uh, the PCA has organized eight site visits, um, and the example was given of the Kishanganga arbitration. I think many of you are familiar with the dispute, the proposed hydroelectric dam that India proposed to build and its impact uh, downriver on Pakistan. If you would like to find out more, I believe one of the poster presentations is about that case. Um, Judge Tomka described the two visits undertaken, very brave tribunal. I think this is 
Judge Tom Cohen hard hat, um, <laughs> President Schwebel uh, undertaken. Uh, part of the PCA's job is to take the photographs and video record of the proceedings. Uh, the second site visit for the two brave umpires who uh, attended in uh, the winter months was conducted in February 2012, and amongst the registry's task was not only accompanying them on the site visit, but the rather challenging task of obtaining insurance for anti-terror for a group uh, uh, making a visit to an area which hadn't been particularly visited before. But Lloyd's insurance, in case you need it. Um, it was mentioned that there was also a site visit in the Bangladesh-India arbitration. Um, so Michael Wood asked some pertinent questions in respect of that. Um, he asked also about um, whether a site visit might have been appropriate in the South China Sea arbitration. And the tribunal did consider that. There are two aspects to understand in respect of the question of a site visit in that case. One is more forensic in nature. Um, what value would the site visit um, have contributed? And the tribunal explained that it considered historical records concerning conditions on features in the Spratly Islands prior to them having been subjected to significant human modification to be more relevant than evidence of the situation currently prevailing. That is, it was interested in the features in their natural form rather than seeing what had been um, artificially constructed. That's the forensic uh, explanation. Um, there's a practical explanation also given. The tribunal had raised the prospect of a site visit. Neither party pressed for it. The Chinese ambassador objected strongly to the possibility of any site visit, and the Philippines also acknowledged that a site visit would present certain challenges. As for the value of site visits that are undertaken, even with the full cooperation of the parties and the provision of um, very safe tiger guards, I, no tigers, no tiger attacks were reported from that visit, um, it's not always obvious what the uh, value of the site visit is. A distinction there has to be made between site visits for the collection of very specific data, like in the Guyana Suriname case, and site visits that are conducted more for the purpose of uh, creating an impression or exposing the tribunal to see what the situation is like on the ground. In that respect, Judge Swabel observed after the Gabshikovo site visit that we gained a new dimension of insight into the case and what it means to the parties more, I think, than we could ever have gleaned from confining the proceedings to The Hague. And similar comments have been made by arbitrators uh, in other site visits. One issue with respect to site visits is how to treat them as a question of evidence or formality. Um, this picture is shown from a PCA site visit conducted in a mixed arbitration. Site visits aren't confined to interstate arbitrations. Um, and in that case, which is similar to the Ecuador jungle visit that Judge Tomka described, the parties actually wanted um, to make submissions during the course of the visit and to have it transcribed. Um, so this was quite a formal process. The PCA um, helped, amongst other logistical sides of things, also in that site visit to negotiate uh, privileges and immunities because some of the participants in the visit were concerned that they might be um, subjected to arrest or danger and that this was um, undertaken by the PCA and the government in question. Um, the, as for the transcribing, this picture shows the court reporter who um, brought all his equipment. He had to invent his own jungle get-up to protect his uh, transcribing machine from the elements of the jungle. Uh, but it's a nice uh, illustration of the adaptability required in the face of the evolving needs of dispute resolution. And that takes me to the final topic. Um, how, how are things changing and how does the PCA's role change? I'd start out by recalling the 1899 convention. It didn't just refer to arbitration but also to fact-finding good offices and mediation. 
and at the PCA, we've seen in the last few years increased interest in alternative forms of dispute resolution. The PCA has conducted four conciliations, uh, including a mixed arbitration relating to a hydroelectric project under the conciliation environmental rules, two cases under the UNCITRAL rules, and as you may be familiar with, the East Timor Australia conciliation, which is uh, ongoing. But in addition to conciliation, there are also other forms of dispute settlement, uh, which are more in the nature of uh, review bodies under treaties. Um, such a mechanism is, for example, included in rudimentary form under the Paris Climate Change Agreement and some of the, uh, environment, uh, the water course treaties that have been referred to today. And a recent PCA example with a slightly, only slightly more glamorous name than the auditing of accounts case is SPRFMO, the South Pacific Regional Fisheries Management Organization. And that was a case uh, involving a multilateral fisheries treaty, which provided for a treaty body to allocate fish catch limits. Um, and it allocated Russia in 2009, um, uh, in the year in question, zero tons of Chilean jack mackerel. Russia was unhappy with that decision and they brought it to a treaty review body that the PCA assisted uh, in administering the proceedings. We did it pro bono. It was done within six weeks. There were four states, one, two intergovernmental organizations and a fishing entity involved. Um, it cost only um, 100,000 euros, which is quite low in the scheme of things for these types of dispute. And happily it was reported that Russia accepted the recommendations. I'll finish with two trends that come across from that case. One is transparency. Arbitration is known for uh, the parties to have differing uh, levels of confidentiality. More and more we see parties willing to make their proceedings more transparent. I've given examples of the ABA, Enrique Lexi and Timor Sea conciliation. Along with transparency comes interest from others who are not party to the proceedings. Um, it's beyond the scope of this talk to talk about interests of non-parties, but we'll be hearing about that tomorrow. In the Philippines-China arbitration, um, there were 10 states that applied to have observer status. Uh, they're pictured there at the hearing, those who attended. And finally, the SPRFMO decision uh, was issued under tight time constraints, six weeks in that case. Uh, this accommodates parties changing needs for decisions within short periods of time, ABA six months from the date of constitution of the tribunal, uh, the Timor Sea conciliation also aiming for a tight time frame. And on that note, I will wrap up. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I should before uh, the next speaker um, intervened to say that I forgot that we have in fact a fourth speaker who is sitting beside me, Dr. Komlang uh, Sangbana, also from the University of Geneva. Uh, he and Professor Laurence Poisson de Chazouan will be sharing the next presentation. So that's presumably around about 10 minutes each, I assume. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, I thank all the organizers for this invitation. It's going to be uh, Duo. We're going to be speaking together. We're going to be speaking about uh, the role of basin organizations, dispute settlement, and maintenance of peace and security. And it's a work in progress as uh, we are thinking of developing further a research project on this uh, theme. So, uh, to start with basin organizations, uh, uh, we have mentioned them this morning, we mentioned them earlier on. They play, I think, a crucial role in what we call water cooperation, whatever is the definition of water cooperation, as we learned uh, this morning. They are among the oldest institutions, and I think what is also interesting when you look at the role of water institutions is that they're very different one from each other. It depends on the treaty, it depends on the region, it depends also on the asymmetric relationships between the riparian states. They also play different functions, so there is a lot of plurality at stake when we speak about basin commissions. So I will first say a few words about their role, 
and the extent of their role. I will then speak about uh, the dispute settlement function and, uh, uh, and link it to peace and security. And the third part will be presented by Kamlan Sangmana, and it's going to be dedicated to the Lake Chad Commission and what is going on in these regions currently. So, uh, if I... No, so it's... Uh, no. How do I turn the... So, uh, first, basin organizations and commissions as forum for dialogue and cooperation. As I said, their role and their profile can vary. I think one thing that we didn't mention, I'm not going to repeat what has already been said about these commissions, but we are very focused, and we have been very focused so far, on interstate cooperation. I think what is important is to realize that more and more, in fact, basin commissions are going to be venues for exchanges between the riparian states, but also exchanges with, between riparian states and international organizations, the World Bank and other organizations, as well as with key stakeholders and sometimes the private sector. In this context, the secretariat of this commission plays an important role and I will mention some case law of the International Court of Justice, but we all know that they are separate organizations with their own uh, legal personalities. That gives them a lot of autonomy in terms of action. Now, when it comes to the activities and functions, I think what is interesting is that it started in the 19th century with uh, the various treaties, and it started with navigation and fishing activities. Now, when you look at the role of these organizations, we are now speaking of hydro plants and production of energy activities, irrigation activities, environmental protection activities, but also, as was mentioned earlier, information collection and dissemination of data. That is crucial with respect to cooperation. And what is also important is that these commissions also are going to be adopting what we call secondary legislation for managing the shared water courses. Now, this is important, and the, the other role I'd like to highlight is that the commissions quite often are going to help states to implement their so-called, I'm not so sure that it's, procedural obligations. I'm not very keen on this distinction between substantive and procedural obligations. But notification, consultation very often is going to be done through these water commissions. And I think that is important. And the court highlighted this aspect in the pulp mills case. So we have these various functions. And as you can see, the scope of activities of these commissions has grown quite a lot. Now, among the functions of the water uh, commissions, we have dispute settlement. And uh, this is something which is interesting is that if you look at current international law and for example the, the uh, 1997 convention you will see that there is an express reference to water commissions with respect to dispute settlement so it's part of uh, general international law now you have some water agreements which are referring also explicitly to the role of water commissions for dispute settlement. And we mentioned some of them and there will be a presentation on the Mekong River Commission too where there is an important role played by the Mekong River Commission. Pulp Mills case, you know about it. There the court spoke about the role of the administrative commission of the River Uruguay as acting as in a conciliatory uh, function. So we have these various mechanisms that can be expressly provided for. Now, there is a recent study which has shown that when it's not provided for in the water agreements through the doctrine of implicit powers, in fact, commissions are playing a very important role with respect to the prevention and the settling of disputes. And I think that is also uh, important because it shows that, in fact, and this is something that we will come back to in the next session, but it shows that in fact states are willing and prefer to settle the disputes at the local level, at the basin level, rather than at the regional or universal level. But there might be situations where you don't really, uh, there is no agreement to settle the dispute at the local or basin level. And uh, I took the example of the uh, case that we did, we have, slightly mentioned this morning, the uh, 
case concerning the land and maritime boundary between Cameroon and Nigeria. There was a, an important series of preliminary objections that were uh, raised by Nigeria, and one of them was to say that, in fact, uh, the treaty in question was providing for dispute settlement mechanisms uh, through the Lake Chad Commission, and we'll come back to that. And the court rejected this objection and said that uh, the Lake Chad Commission didn't have exclusive jurisdiction rationale material of a dispute involving border questions. I think the issue of border questions is important uh, as it's true that it's not specifically addressed in the treaty. But the question that I have is that would there be, if it's not a border issue, if it's another issue, would the court have had the same reasoning? And shouldn't we consider that there should first be an exhaustion of diplomatic means as addressed by the treaties before going before the International Court of Justice with respect to these issues of management of a water course? Another question, and, and, uh, and the court, I think, in the pulp mills case, has, in fact, has highlighted the fact that it depends on the treaties, it depends on the circumstances, and so on. So I think the, the relationship between diplomatic and judicial means should be reviewed, and we should maybe come back to that uh, in, in the discussion. Now, there is another issue, and that is uh, with respect to peace and security. So I spoke about dispute settlement, but you know that dispute settlement is also linked to collective security and think about chapter eight of the charter and think for example of article 52 of uh, the charter. And there, this is also the, uh, the uh, Cameroon Nigeria case is also an interesting one because as there was another objection which was to say that in fact issues of peace and security should first be resolved at the level of the regional organizations before going before the International Court of Justice. And I'm going to quote the court in this context. The court said, while acknowledging that the Lake Chad Commission has the status of an international organization, organization nevertheless, ex it excluded the institutions from the scope of ch uh, chapter eight of the charter because it did not have, a nice quote, as its purpose to the settlement of a uh, in the, at a regional level of matters relating to the maintenance of international peace and security. This was in 1998, and I think that already in 1998, I think it was a conservative statement. But today, today we're in 2017, and in fact, if you look at the activity of the Security Council, it's quite interesting, because the Security Council now is linking traditional collective security issues with access to natural resources. Think about the debates about climate change, think, think about the issues in terms of the spread of diseases, cholera, and so on. And think also about the two open discussions that the Security Council had on water issues in November 2016 and in June 2017. So the question which is important is that there, in fact, it seems to me that basin commissions could now be considered as regional organizations in the conception uh, as understood by the um, chapter eight of the charter. And uh, we will be speaking about the Lake Chad uh, Commission, but if we refer to the treaty of 1964, it's quite interesting to see that the, the states in 1964 had already said that the commission should guarantee peace by avoiding conflicts that may arise for the exploitation of resources in the region. So already they had this prism of peace and security. Now I go back to the relationship with the International Court of Justice. And there I agree with the court when the court said in, this, in the Cameroon-Nigeria decision that even if it was a regional organization in the meeting of chapter eight, that would not preclude the possibility to go before the International Court of Justice. So with this, I have presented an issue which I think is an important issue in terms of governance of peace and security and the linking with uh, natural resources. I have only presented one facet of collective security, dispute settlement in the meaning of Article 52. And now Kamlan Sangbana is going to be looking at peace and security from the prism of enforcement actions in the meaning of Article 53 of the Charter. Thank you.
Thank you. As we have heard, the uh, Basin Commission can play an important role in conflict uh, prevention, dispute resolution, as well as peace and security maintenance. In my presentation, I will focus on the lecture Basin Commission experience um, to underline the future of this, its contribution for peace and security maintenance and also show the limitation of this kind of activity for uh, Basin uh, Commission. Established in 1964 the, by the Four Lamy Convention, the main task of the Lake Chad Basin Commission is to ensure the most efficient use of the basin uh, waters, to coordinate development of this basin and to assist in the settlement of any dispute that may arise between the riparian uh, countries. The Lake Chad, as we can see in the figure, the Lake Chad Basin is located in the vast Sahelian uh, region, covering an area of um, uh, 967,000 kilometers square, shared by five states, namely Cameroon, Central African Republic, Ni uh, Republic Niger, Nigeria, and Chad. In 2008, uh, Libya joined the LCBC the Commission and became its sixth uh, member. But the Lake Chad region is also uh, characterized by a combination of major security and socio-political socio challenges. In particular, the emergence of an expansion of the Islamist group Boko Haram has raised concern on peace and security in the Lake Chad Basin. So we can just see the, the map here to, to have an idea. Originating in the northeast Nigeria, so here, northeast Nigeria, the Boko Haram insurgency has been ongoing for the past seven years, gradually spreading to other parts of the country, as well as to the large portion of the Lake Chad Basin, threatening the stability of the region. Several studies have highlighted the fact that the emergence and expansion of this group is largely the result of the social inequality among population in this area and the disinvestment of state in this outlying uh, area. This factor, together with impact of climate change on the economic and social structure in the basin have made the population uh, vulnerable. So please, let me give you a few words of field testimony. During my research visit, I had the chance to conduct survey in two villages in the Lake Chad Basin, Gite and Mitterine. In the Chad portion, yes, this is true. In the Chad uh, portion of the, of the, of the lake. And and these two villages have the particularity to be, have been hit by Boko Haram uh, activities. So we have two um, explosions there with uh, uh, dead, uh, dead people there. It was sad to observe that in these villages, there was no hospital or public school, no drinking water or electricity, and prospect in terms of uh, jobs for thousands of people who live uh, there are limited to fishing activities and agriculture, and most of them are employees. In addition, those activities are affected by the continuous shrinking of the lake due to the combined effect of anthropogenic and natural factors. As a consequence, there is a very high rate of unemployed person, especially among the youth. It is interesting to note that at the same time, Boko Haram group pay its recruit around 300,000 from CFA, it's about uh, 458, twice the average salary of, uh, of an average official in Chad, or five and 10 times the minimum wage that these young people could, could receive as a worker in the field or uh, fishing or agriculture. So it's not being surprising that many young join the group and generally on media, we heard that enrollment in Boko Haram group is being by force, but in the field, the reality is more complex than that, and highlight clearly the link between socio-economic uh, development and security issues. And in this context, the LCBC emerged as the first strategic uh, framework for the maintenance of peace and security in the Lake Chad uh, Basin uh, region. This is, say, it is important to note that the choice of LCBC to coordinate military operation against Boko Haram appears more 
uh, a default choice than anything else. In effect, the definition of the common strategy to combat the Boko Haram phenomenon has long stumbled on the fact that the state directly affected did not find an appropriate form, uh, forum for cooperation to discuss uh, the, the, the issue. All attempts to develop uh, a common strategy through sub-regional organizations that have mandated international peace and security have systematically uh, failed. So uh, the majority of the country uh, concerned belong, since uh, the majority of the country concerned belong to the LCBC and Boko Haram outrage, had uh, spread to the shore of the Lake Chad Basin, the organization appeared uh, as a natural or default institutional framework to take on this uh, effort. Uh, through its mandate, the, um, through its mandate and competencies, state members consider that uh, the Lake Chad Commission can contribute primarily to the prevention of threats, to international peace and security as a tool for the socio-economic uh, development of the Lake Chad Basin. In view of the major risk of insecurity and destabilization in the region, the LCBC has been also positioned as a strategic framework for the coordination of military operation for the restoration of international peace and security. The LCBC contribution as tool for promoting uh, socioeconomic development of the Lake Chad Basin reflect a preventive approach in securing the Lake Chad Basin. As a tool for socioeconomic development, the LCBC contributes to peace and security in the region by addressing the cause of activities that threaten peace and security. It, is, it, it might be said that the LCBC, uh, through the tax assigned to it, is in, to it in its constitutive instrument is fully in line with this objective. Because, as I say, the main tax of the Commission is to promote and coordinate development of the, the Lake Chad Basin in order to ensure the socioeconomic development of the population of the basin. This objective is set out uh, both in the Lake Chad Basin vis uh, 2000. Uh, 25 Lake Chad Basin Vision, and also in the, um, one of the most important instrument, uh, regulated, legal instrument regulated the, the development of the Lake Chad Basin, the Lake Chad Basin Water Charter. Therefore, in this mind, the program and projects to be developed under the LCBC uh, go beyond water allocation issues to address economic and development needs. In this perspective, it was almost normal for the LCBC to be propelled by European countries to address the, the root cause that led to the emergence and expansion of the Boko Haram group. The LCBC has elaborated two programs for this purpose in 2016. So the Lecture Development and Climate Resilient Action Plan with the, the, the support of the World Bank and also the emergency program on priority development for the youth and vulnerable population of the Lake Chad uh, region. Uh, both programs intend to contribute to food security, employment, and the social inclusion of the youth by improving uh, in a sustainable way the living condition of the uh, population. It is, we can consider also that uh, this kind of perception is finally common to basin organization in West Africa where these organizations are primarily perceived as a tool to promote socio-economic development. The second contribution of the LCBC to the fight against the Boko Haram threat is more peculiar. Uh, considering the, considering the, 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 um, the threat posed by the Boko Haram uh, group to the region, LCBC decided to step up uh, a military response by reactivating the multinational uh, joint tax force. Uh, in effect, the decision to establish uh, such a force has taken place for the first time in 1994 to combat um, organized crime and banditry. By finally, uh, the, the mechanism didn't work because uh, uh, some rivalries and dispute among states, and we can mention the, um, the dispute between Cameroon and Nigeria concerning the Balkasi Peninsula and the Lake Chad uh, region. Uh, all thought, the multinational task force is an initiative of the LCBC. Only four or six member states, Cameroon, Niger, and Nigeria, Nigeria and Chad, joined by no members, Benin, are part of the force. Uh, as a result, the, M, the multinational task force appears as a coalition of states that came into being to confront a common uh, threat. 
and we can see in the mandate of the in the mandate of the the, 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 the force we is, uh, we is, is to create a safe and secure environment in the area affected by the activities of Boko Haram and other terrorist groups. Uh, recognizing the complexity of this mission, three components, military, police, and civilian, were to be established. To date, only the first was achieved with approximately 3,000 military, and they are engaged in the basin itself. No definitive evaluation of the operation is available, but it has been held as a notable success in the fight against Boko Haram. Sus point out, among other achievements, the release of hostage, the liberation of certain area previously occupied by Boko Haram. Nevertheless, the establishment of LCBC multinational uh, joint task force remained in precedent and raised several questions. Actually, no provision of the statute predisposed LCBC to as a side such a mandate. The only provisions that outline the potential role of the LCBC with respect to conflict is Article 9 G, mentioned by the Professor Basson Chazun. But since the conflict involves non-state actors and imply recourse to enforcement measures, this provision cannot be used as legal basis uh, for the LCBC action. So, yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, the first question is that. Um, could we then consider the LCBC Act as a regional organization on, under Article 53 of Chapter um, 8 of the United Nations Charter? Um, first of all, the first act uh, that had made by the LCBC was to obtain formal authorization from the African Union Peace and Security who is the standing organ of the Uni African Union for the Prevention, Management, and Resolution of Conflict. So while the force was created by the summit of LCBC member states and Benin, its deployment was endorsed and authorized, authorized by the uh, African Union Peace and Security Council. In addition, uh, our of its limits in the field of the deployment and management of peace operation, LCBC agreed that AU will oversee the strate strategic piloting of the MTNG. F. Therefore, uh, while the force operates under the direct authority of the LCBC and the head of state of government, the RU act as a strategic and technical partner to effective operation of the force. Conclusion. <laughs> uh, few more minutes. Um, the next one, the, the next support is very important is the the endorsement by the United Security Council Resolution uh, 2349. In this resolution, uh, the, um, the Security Council, uh, you, you, the Security Council, praised uh, the force action against Boko Haram. And by this wording, the Security Council appeared to have endorsed this uh, giant task force and authorized the organization to act under uh, Article 53. Um, a remaining question to finish, I will finish with that, is could we consider that, could we consider that um, SABG mandate in international peace and security maintenance is compatible with the tax that can be assigned to a Bison Commission? Apart from the personal feeling to be more in military base in the water uh, than in a water resource institution when we arrive uh, in the LCBC water uh, head cutter. The first consideration deal with the, which deal, who, consideration that could hamper the exercise of SCB mandate to manage and protect water resources. The first one is the restriction to access and use of certain data and information. Actually, that and information which is considered important to the conduit of military operation can be subject to prior authorization of the military hierarchy. So this can lead to tension between the military and technical expert. The second one is that uh, the development, shame, of, and the civilian staff of the SCBC to, can become potential target of Islamic action. So. And um, the last one, we can observe that the coordination of military activities supersede resource management activity. Uh, the political organs are more focused on military issues than to think to the implementation of management uh, program. 
So finally, uh, what in, uh, we can observe that is the staff seems to be technic um, technically um, in employee. So I think that I will finish finally, uh, <laughs> finally there. Yeah. Well, we um, we have some time for questions. Um, anyone? Yes, Eric Franks. Thank you very much. I have a question for Mrs. Levine. Um, when you showed your one of your first slides, there was a, a steady increase in the number of cases recently of the PCA. Now, if I listened carefully to you, you made a distinction between PCA cases and PCA registered cases. Do you make a distinction between these two notions, or is it all the same? Uh, no, all of the cases on that graph represented cases with full PCA registry support. Um, they are all cases that are administered by the PCA. There have been some five or 600 other cases where we have uh, assisted in constituting the tribunal that we call appointing authority matters. I haven't included them in that chart. Uh, but the chart does include the different types of cases, state to state or mixed arbitration. Yes, question over here. Uh, question to uh, uh, Judith. Have I understood you correctly or heard you correctly when you said that the Indus Waters Treaty refers to the PCA? No, it does not refer to the PCA. The Indus Waters Treaty says that at the first meeting of yeah, the Court of Arbitration, the court shall establish its secretariat and appoint a treasurer. And therefore, any it does anticipate that a secretariat will be necessary. Um, as to how it then comes to the PCA, uh, it's a matter of the uh, parties and tribunal wanting an experienced institution to be able to handle the logistical side of things. No, I, I, I'm glad yeah, I did for clarification because I was involved at the World Bank Water Law Advisor in the bagley uh, difference. And one of the questions that arose when we, uh, the bank was in the verge of appointing the Nigeria expert was to whether to ask the PCA to act as the secretary for the neutral expert. That was discussed. And then we left it aside because we thought this is a, an engineer, not a lawyer. This is not really a fully fledged legal process. So it may be better to leave the PCA after, after that. But you are right about the clarification. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's up to the parties to decide what kind of uh, role. The, the PCA has um, served in fact-finding, assisted in fact-finding commissions and has helped with the appointment of neutral experts, but that, that treaty is silent as to which organisation will perform that role. It obviously mentions the World Bank for other the aspects. The Mahakali Treaty has a reference to the PCA. The Mahakali Treaty between India and Pakistan has a specific reference to the PCA. You might want to add that. Uh, if I may interject, possibly, for what it's worth... Um, my, my first ever case, I was asked to represent the European Commission in a, a case brought by Chile, the swordfish case. And um, the second question the Commission asked me was, how much would this arbitration cost? <laughs> and I had just given a paper in Cambridge on the swordfish case. And I asked Eddie Lauterpach, how much did it cost, Eddie? And he gave me a figure. and I conveyed it to the European Commission. Um, the response after a while was, but that would bankrupt our budget. <laughs> now, that was the legal officer's budget, not the European Commission's budget. But that was quite relevant, actually. And that was why they transferred it by agreement with Chile to a chamber of the Itlos. Now, the chamber of the Itlos is as free as a chamber or indeed the full court of the ICJ. And that is an, imp an important issue. But in a lot of the C case, you, you have that, 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 that freedom is relatively easily there. I think in the, the important point, it seems to me, from Judith's presentation is that the PCA does its best to keep the costs down. One of the difficulties with the, sort of, with the um, Blue Ventuna case was that it was run by the World Bank, and I'm not sure that they did quite such a good job at keeping the costs down. Or it was run by ICSID, and I think that turned out to be a much more expensive operation for some reason. Now, um, yes. Thanks, uh, I'm Walter John Knight, and my question goes to Itai. Um, we observe a time it was increasing love with sovereignty. 
more and more states believe that it makes sense and they are engaged with sovereignty. So the question is the following. Do you think that these states, which heavily rely on the concept of sovereignty and their sovereign control, they would rather go for a risk-averting uh, position and conclude agreements which would fix the amounts or would they rather go for the open-ended treaties, which leaves them more sovereign room to maneuver in the long term? So how can you factor in this love for sovereignty into your scheme, in other words? It's a big question. I, I, I don't know where to start, but obviously the mechanisms have a sovereignty cost. And I believe that the more the mechanisms touch upon issues of security and peace, as was mentioned in the previous presentation, the sovereignty cost rise dramat dramatically. The more the commission, the more the mechanisms are technical, they would infringe less upon issues of sovereignty. So if you go into a contentious area, conflict. Again, I don't know which one of them works better. That's a different question. But you are more likely to find technical arrangements, low-key ones that do not touch upon issues of sovereignty, allegedly do not touch. Therefore, I would be very careful to securitize, at least in terms of language or in framing those mechanisms allow them as much as you can to be a low profile one. Um, Attila Tanze. Um, a short remark concerning Judith's uh, presentation, um, a lot about arbitration. And in the end, you mentioned ADR. There is a development that occurred last year which struck me for what happened then, which is going to happen now. I mean, there was much of an impassioned debate over a rather innovative inclusion of a third party compulsory mechanism in the New York Convention in 1997 that was very much hailed by the representative from Switzerland, Kaflisch, which withheld a number of states from actually joining the convention, ratifying the convention. But now the convention has entered into force. And once it has entered into force, it may pick up. And that is a rather unusual compulsory third party fact-finding mechanism, which I doubt ever would be triggered and carried out in a void. And that might provide an opportunity for the PCA rules on fact-finding, which have been adopted a number of years ago, to, to be put to fruition. And, um, and good luck with that. Thank you. If I could just add one short comment on the costs question. Um, I think there are a number of empirical studies that show in dispute resolution and arbitration that of the total costs to the parties, about 85% of those costs are spent on their lawyers, about 5% on the institution and about 10% on the tribunal. So even if you are accessing a forum where the judges are um, provided as a result of your member state contributions um, to the annual budget, you still need to pay the lawyers. Uh, so one thing to think of in cost management is shortening the length of time that you need to pay your lawyers. <laughs> you can that. All right. Yeah, with respect to the sovereignty cost, um, what we intended to do with Scomran was to show that um, the situations can differ from one region to another one, okay? And in Africa, we have very peaceful situations, like, for example, with respect to the Senegal River, for the time being, the four riparian countries have been able to prevent conflicts from arising or have been able to settle them quite quickly. Now, with respect to the Lake Chad region, it's a very important conflict which is going on, and uh, in a way, these riparian countries, they've been hijacked by the international community. Yeah? In a way, it's, it's true that, and Comran has attempted to show that, that the root cause of this problem are linked to mismanagement, 
not good development and so on. And access to natural resources in this region is the primary income for most of the people fishing activities. So there was something to be done. I don't think it was the choice of these countries to choose the Lake Chad Commission as the locus for settling these issues, but it was mostly the African Union and then the Security Council of the United Nations. And uh, I entirely agree that we should find a way not to militarize these commissions because they should be, remain sort of neutral, technical, and so on. But what we see is that in some regions, and we're going to have other examples that are going to be exposed later on, it's quite difficult from preventing that. So this, in the context of the Lake Chad region, and it's a question that I'd like to, to, to search on, is that there is a shared responsibility of the international community together with the states, but how to resolve this situation? That is a big question. And on that happy note, or unhappy note as the case may be, uh, I think we should bring this session to an end. Um, could I, on a personal note, thank the organizers what's, I think, been an excellent conference so far. I'm sure it will continue to be. And could I ask you to join me in thanking our speakers this afternoon. <laughs>